it takes a lot for our next speaker to take this stage. He's very courageous. He's done a lot more for us than put us in prison. It's a very honor to introduce the former Manhattan District Attorney, Cyrus Vance. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm really grateful for having been asked to be here today with you. I think it has been an incredible afternoon, and I certainly have learned a lot. Delia, thank you for not just this afternoon, but for all your work in this space. And Liz, thank you for running the Osborne Association for that for so many years and for sharing your story. And of course, I want to thank the men who spoke before me and before us for the, you know, the honesty uh, with which you shared your stories. And it brings to mind for me um, the challenge of how we as prosecutors, and I ran the Manhattan DA's office, 600 lawyers, up to 100,000 cases a year uh, at, at its highest, how we fail or where we can do better and where we do all right in terms of our role uh, in this system. And one challenge is we all in this system tend to take roles. Prosecutors are viewed as wanting to put people in jail, same as police officers. Defense lawyers are viewed as only wanting to get people out of jail. And we tend to be boxed in by how others perceive us. And I think a lot of the problem about that is we haven't had proximity to each other to listen to each other and to understand each other. I invited Brian Stevenson, who you all know who he is, to come to the Manhattan DA's office and talk to the assistant DA's and our professional staff. And of course, 600 lawyers, 500 showed up. Professional staff was there. They were off the rafters uh, coming to hear Brian speak. And he gave a beautiful talk, but what he said about what he asked us to be in our job was proximate. That is, proximate in the sense of understanding and being open to and perhaps taking time to be with the people with whom you deal with in your professional life, whether defense, defendants or um, witnesses. And I thought uh, what Brian's really talking about is being seen, uh, that men and women who come through this system uh, want, and I think we can do a much better job of seeing them for who they are, not just what they've done, but also seeing them for what they can do and may do. And I want to tell you, I saw every one of the men here this morning uh, who spoke. Two of them had cases with my office when I was district attorney, and they didn't come up to me to complain about the sentence or to argue their points. They came up because I believe they needed to be seen and they wanted closure. And I want to tell you two gentlemen, I saw you and I am very grateful that you came to me so that I could meet you at a very different point in your lives. Which brings up another important point and problem we have. None of these men are the same men who went in however many years ago they went in. And this is a challenge for prosecutors because when someone is sent to jail, and if it's a very serious case, it could be a parole case, which is typically the case, prosecutors tend to freeze frame the person who comes up for parole 10 to 15 years later with what that person did 10 to 15 years before. It's extra effort to go back in and really understand what happened. It's extra effort to reach out to the victims uh, and their families to explain where we are and what would they like to see and to put both sides out there. And when that doesn't happen, you have situations where men remain in prison because they're not being seen for who they have become. And in part, that's the job of a prosecutor who sent them to jail to own them and part of their future in jail. Now, when I was a young assistant DA in Manhattan, I had, uh, and I was a young aggressive prosecutor, two of the worst words to a defendant is to have a young and aggressive prosecutor, but that is who I was. And I was dealing with a kidnapping and robbery case involving a young woman, a black woman named Pam Bowens, who was crack addicted. 
And it was a serious case. It was robbery. It was a borderline kidnapping case. And I was determined that Pam Bowens should go to state prison. And for two years, I fought forward to progress that case to trial. We went up to the appellate department and back. And at some point, something clicked within me. Maybe I was just exhausted and relented. But I was convinced by the defense attorney and the judge that I should offer Pam probation and drug treatment because she was crack addicted when this happened in lieu of a prison sentence. And I ultimately, after pushing this case vigorously, said, okay. And when I walked out of that courtroom in 1986, I didn't think of Pam Bowens once until 20 years, 15 years later, when she called me when I was in Seattle, Washington, practicing law. And she got me on the phone and she said, Sai, this is Pam Bowens, do you, know, do you remember me? And I said, of course I do, Pam. How have you been? What, why are you calling? And she said, Sai, because you enabled me by reducing the charge so I could plead to a non-jail charge to get sent to drug diversion, I completed the diversion, I got rid of the addiction, I went to college, I got honors in college, I went to work with uh, men and women who were drug addicted, and I've been a counselor, and I'm applying for my real estate license in New York, and I'd like you to write me a letter to the governor's office supporting that. And so I said, I said, Pam, of course, I mean, I'd be happy to. And in that moment, this was maybe five, six years before I came back to New York City, and I was a defense lawyer, as I say at the time, I understood, and I saw Pam differently. I just saw her 15 years later. And I understand and understood how important it is that we see people for who they can become, not just what they did to get there in the first place. Fast forward five years, I'm running for district attorney. I'm on the street at 125th Street, the days before the primary, Peg is with me. It's at nighttime, and a young woman comes up to Peg, not me, and is crying. And she's crying because her brother's getting out of prison, and she's desperately trying to find some support for him when he gets out of prison, some support that's offered by the agencies that sent him to prison, and she wanted to know, what can I do? Where do I go? Peg, being Peg, went back, went on the district attorney's website, this was before I was in office, and came back and said, Cy, there is not a single program that's noted on your website about reentry and about this phase and this person, what she can turn to. And Peg never let me forget in the 12 years that I was Manhattan DA after, how important it was that men and women who are sent to prison be supported in their efforts to return home and to succeed once they have returned home. And I want to thank Peg for that. Now, it was fortunate that as district attorney, I had what most DAs don't have. I had a lot of money. I had money because we had prosecuted inter international banks, uh, and investigated them uh, for violation sanctions legislation. This is moving money into the United States banking system from places that can't, shouldn't be able to do that. Iran, Sudan, Libya, and these banks were doing it and hiding the source of their income. We're talking about trillions of dollars. The cases ultimately were resolved, all 14 or 12, at $14 billion. One billion of that came to the Manhattan DA's office. It bill by statute. I didn't steal it. It came by statute, um, and that's called forfeiture. It's not tax dollars. It's the proceeds of crime that were sent to us by statute. And so we had an opportunity to focus not just on gang indictments where we were taking people out of communities, but what could we as an office with this remarkable opportunity do to put resources and support back into the communities? And we created something called the Criminal Justice Investment Fund. And we, at the time we created it, the six years we had it before I left, we were one of, if not the largest, criminal justice foundation in the country, supporting great organizations like the Osborne Institute. But what I was really focused on, because of our experience, 
at 125th Street and other employees in my office, I was very focused on re-entry. And I wanted to make sure the office was exploring how we could help in the re-entering process. What prosecutors don't remember often is that in the penal code, right at the beginning, one of the primary goals of our justice system identified by the legislature that passed these laws is to promote effective re-entry for returning citizens back to their communities. But I promise you, probably one in a hundred lawyers who do criminal practice actually know that's supposed to be part of our job. So in any event, uh, we had great opportunities. We were privileged to be able to fund the college prison program throughout New York State. Uh, why? Because as one of the speakers mentioned, not only is it the right thing to do, but I know, and knew as district attorney, that getting a college degree in prison was the most effective way to reduce recidivism that one has. So it was a politically difficult decision for the governor to do. He asked, came to me and complained, and I said, we can do that. It gave us the opportunity to think about reentry at the same time as think about proximity between our office and the men and women who were coming home from prison. We opened up a program in Queensboro Correctional Facility, uh, which is unique, but I think speaks to what we should be aspiring toward big picture. Every three months, a team of assistant district attorneys would go to Queensboro over the course of three months and take classes in Queensboro with individuals coming back from prison who were there at the same time. And they studied the classics, they studied literature, they learned together, they were curious together, and when they got out of prison, they came and we, every three months, had a program where the ideas that the prosecutors and the young men and women who were coming out of prison would be shared and presented to the public. And I will tell you that that program changed the lives of the assistant DAs who participated. They saw, they were proximate. They saw these men and women as they had never seen them before. And uh, we were privileged to be able to do that. Now, Peg worked in the Puppies Behind Bars program. One of the prisons was Fishkill, and this is a phenomenal program that teaches men and women, men incarcerated, I think men and women, to train service dogs over a period of two years from puppies into service dogs that are then given to returning men and women who were coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and also now to first responders. Uh, and it was wonderful to observe many times, peg at work, but to be proximate with these men and women uh, in prison, uh, much as we are today. And I had the opportunity to meet and talk with them uh, in ways where we were having conversations about our families, our spouses, our kids, uh, who we had become and what we were doing. And it was an amazing opportunity for me to have proximity with these people. And Peg, again, I want to thank you for that. But where this goes at the end is we can do so much better, so much better in how we manage as prosecutors our work in the criminal justice system. And I look at the system as a waterfall. We meet people at the bottom of the waterfall. We meet people when they've gone over the top and are now criminally charged. That's where we meet people. We would be so much better off if more offices were capable of meeting young men and women at the top of the waterfall, in the communities, in a place where they could share their common humanity outside of being a part of the system. And that's what we tried to do at the DA's office, working, supporting programming, youth hubs throughout Manhattan for young men and women to be able to get a host of training and activities. We opened up 100 plus basketball sites in New York City uh, for basketball training and sports training on Friday and Saturday nights. These were all opportunities that I think uh, helped us do a better job and help me as district attorney 
focus on not just what was going on in the courtroom, but our responsibilities in the community. So thank you all for letting me share this with you, the men today. Thank you so much, and thank you, Delia.